I'm Ken Rosenthal from Fox MLB Network. This is Mark Shapiro, president of the Cleveland Indians. Thank you. And back in his baseball days, <laughs> general manager days, two-time executive of the year. He's happy to push me out right off the edge. <laughs> That's right. Mark has a long career in baseball at this point, 21 years. Started in 1992 with the Indians. His entire career has been with the Indians. And in his career, he has played a variety of roles from assistant in the baseball operations department, I guess it's the bottom, the place where you start. Yeah. Cubicle dweller. Cubicle no dweller. titled cubicle dweller. Was the, uh, was the office as fancy as it looked in Moneyball back Oh then? my God. No. All right, anyway. still, still isn't. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I aspire to those offices. Those look like the spring training offices for the Rockies and Diamondbacks. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> the Rockies and Diamondbacks facility is quite a place. But anyway. Mark went on to become farm director from 94 to 98. Yeah. And then, let's assistant see, GM. assistant GM under John Hart. Right. 99 to 2001, and then took over as general manager. Now, yesterday we talked a little bit about the growth of analytics and how it all started. And Jerry Depoto made the point, hey, it's been going on forever. When I was looking at Rod Carew's baseball card, and certainly the history of analytics goes way back before the rise of computers or anything like that. At the same time, what has given such momentum to the movement is the explosion of information. And what we're going to talk about with Mark is basically how things have changed in his world and all of our worlds, but especially in baseball, since he started way back when, <laughs> pre-cell phones. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I think the only people that had them were just the uh, GM and assistant GM, that was it. The game reports were called in via fax, you know, and then transcribed. I think we modem became, it was like first or second year, we went to the modem. So. All right, so this is when you started. Let's start in yeah. 1992. What was it like in baseball operations with regards to analytics and with what was available? Yeah, so I think decision making, right? That's the best, that's the best way to look at it and, uh, because that's the best application for analysis and data and technology. And for me, you know, uh, the convergence of those three is what's most interesting. You know, one of the three, you know, analysis without the data is, is not that meaningful. But when you converge the three of those things, the amount of data being generated today um, whether it's just HD video, which is, you know, 2.5 million times the amount of data we had, you know, back in 1992, um, or you look at, you know, pitch FX and what that generates, you know, compared to what we have and, and on the verge of hit and field FX and uh, our own proprietary uh, data that, in, that we can develop. Um, so it's, it's managing the data, it's doing the analysis, it's having a techno technology to apply it. Um, so the data, uh, the technology in 1992 were stat books on our laps uh, as we sat around the room. Um, it was filing cabinets behind John Hart's desk that had scouting reports uh, that were printed off. Um, and a, a lot of time was spent compiling the information to make a decision. You know, so the variables that go into decision are, you know, medical, um, psychological and mental, financial. Uh, statistical, and obviously that's been elevated to another level, but still we had statistics that we looked at, and then subjective information, scouting reports. Um, and someone like me in a cubicle and two or three other people would be, you know, charged with, we have a trade, get this information together. And we would start pulling media guides, literally off behind and pull the biographical information. We would start, you know, going to the scouting and, and reading scouting reports and some, and that's literally what we did. And then kind of make a presentation to John who had to make a decision and John would get on the phone and call scouts or if we were at the winter meetings, you know, scouts would raise their hands, you know, with the books in their laps and, you know, and talk about a decision. Um, so, you know, along the way, it's been an evolution, not, not one thing, not, um, you know, they're, they're, a movie may lead you to believe that just, you know, one organization at one moment in time kind of changed the world, but, and they did lead a lot of, uh, a lot of maybe what was done, but, um, there's been a, a group of people who I think, you know, have always pushed for how do we apply technology? How, where can we look for advantages? Where are the incremental efficiencies? Where do they, um, you know, where do they lie? And how can we, um, frankly, just look for, um, you know, areas where we can beat people and, and find small, you know, opportunities to do that? It's been more and more important for us as our market has dramatically changed. Um, you know, we have to bridge the gaps, uh, you know, in a multitude of ways now. Um, rather than just exploit, you know, resources, which is, you know, what we did before. And I think it's been more essential the way we made decisions. And, um, 
you know, now, and, and, and I think what, you know, Chris, you heard yesterday talk as a GM, what he really led as an assistant GM was, let's flip the model from spending 80% of our time assembling the information and 20% of our time analyzing it to let's, you know, develop technology that allows us to compile the information in almost in real time or, you know, all the time, um, have really smart people analyzing it, and then, you know, we can spend much more time analyzing it and applying it to making a decision. And, hopefully make more decisions uh, correctly or right uh, more frequently because we're spending, we're flipping that model. Now, when that delineates did the change occur the other, in the other simply the amount of information? Then, myself. I remember um, talking to Paul DePodesta, so that who of course is now with the Mets, former assistant GM with the A's, general manager of the Dodgers. And he told me he could remember and started the with the Indians. And started with the Indians. <laughs> yeah. Hired by you, right? Uh, I think Dan and I both were involved in this okay. hiring. Dan Sorry about that. Yeah. But anyway, he told me that he could remember the day when he was told, he was driving along on some back road scouting, and he pulled over the side of the road and was told that they could now link the video to the data. Right. And it was that meaningful a moment. Do you remember such a moment where things kind of came together? I mean, I can remember, you know, it's, you know, John Hart's computer in his office never being turned on. And him saying, I'm not turning this thing on until I can touch the screen, which is, you know, think about that. He was joking. Until <laughs> you, till I, till I can turn it on and touch the screen, I'm, you know, John, now John, I'm sure he's an iPad user now, you know? I mean, he's, he's touching the screen. He's got a tablet and he's probably doing it. So I know I get text messages from him, so he's definitely texting, you know? But, you know, I just think, you know, it's, it's at a certain point in time, you know, there was an openness to a different type of executive, you know, a different type of front office personnel. And, um, you know, when I came in, it was, uh, you know, I used to joke the five families. There was the, you know, there were a very small number of the McPhails, the Bavazies, the Quins, you know, a small number of people who were a lot of great executives, but historical executives in the game. There were ex-players, um, and there really was no role for anyone outside of that. Um, and uh, I got a great opportunity from John and Dan, and I was empowered to make you know, to really make some changes. And then um, they started a pattern where Josh Burns started with us and Paul DePodesta started with us and Neil Huntington and Chris Antonetti. And, you know, and I think that I, I would say it started with people. It started with, you know, intellectual capital. And let's find some really smart people, combine them with great baseball people and see if you bring these people together and empower them to improve the decision making process and improve the quality of information and elevate um, the processes throughout the organization in general, without ever disrespecting, you know, the game or the tradition and what makes it special, you know, how much better can you be? And that race for smarter, more talented people who still understand and respect the culture, because that's extremely important or it's in ineffective anyway, um, you know, to me is what changed the tide. And now it's just, it's a nonstop, you wake up every day, what am I missing? You know, you read, you know, trade rumors, you read, analytics, you read an article on prospectus and you're like, are we doing this? You know, some, and I, you know, I always get the answer, yes, we've already, we've already looked into that, yes, you know, but I, I wake up with that anxiety, you know, because there's constantly new frontiers being pushed and there's an openness to who can make us better. And that's kind of, you know, when young people come to me and say, you know, how do I get in, you know, how do I start, you know, my response is, you know, we look for people that the day they walk through the door will make us better. You know, we look for people that have demonstrated at some point uh, already that they're going to come in the door and they're going to continue to elevate our thinking and push us or have done something in, either in video or in scouting or in analytics that are going to help us be better the day they walk through the door. Now you talked about Chris Antonetti flipping the model. Now I assume one reason you could go more heavy toward analysis was the simple availability of the data and more quickly put together. I'm wondering without giving away any proprietary secrets. What did Chris do to basically get the Indians going in that direction? I think it was more we reverse engineered it. You know, we looked at it from a decision. What information would we want to have in a decision? You know, and, and that's where we started from. You know, you've got, like I said, I, I look at every decision, and this is the beauty of baseball. We can, we can talk about analytics and data and technology all we want, but in, at the bottom line, when you get down to a decision, A, our assets are still human. They're not stocks, they're not real estate, they're, they're flesh. They are filled with frailties that are gonna allow us to never predict them. Um, and B, there's still an art to the ultimate decision, the final decision, because, because no computer and no program is ever gonna spit out the answer. You know, what the information does and what the data does and what the technology does and what the 
brilliant analysts do, are give us better input. Better input to allow us to make the decision. How you weight that input um, and how you factor that into your own operating conditions and circumstances and develop a strategy and how consistently you execute on that strategy, you know, rather than get impacted by emotion and momentum by writers and broadcasters Who? And, <laughs> and fans and, and just, you know, think about it this way, you know, a guy or a woman making a major executive decision for a publicly traded company has to deal with stock price, which is, can affect your emotions. You know, I've got to walk into my son's school every day and hear his teacher tell me his opinion. I've got to walk to the barber, you know, at lunch and have him tell me his opinion. Everybody else waiting to get a haircut tell me their opinions. I've got to deal with the guy, you know, at the, at the uh, counter checking out, you know, getting a deli sandwich, give me, and, and then pick up the paper in the morning, and even if I say I'm not going to read it, open it up and see it scrawl across the top, you know, Indians fall free back to, to the Tigers, you know, desolate, you know, whatever. I, it, the emotion it, and, and the amount of, you know, can impact any strategy. So the ability to maintain a strategy um, to, to, uh, to kind of wall yourself off as best you possibly can from that emotion and momentum that swirls around you, that lies in more of an objective process and that lies in a framework for making a decision. So I think there's still, you know, you can have great input and we've tried to always elevate, elevate the quality of the input, but how you apply it to a decision and whether or not you stay that course and whether an owner allows you to stay that course are still gonna be, are gonna vary from team to team. Fast forward a little bit to now and to your role as club president. But before I get right into that, there was something we talked about, I think in September, and in analytics, how everyone is caught up now. How yeah. the teams like yourself and Oakland, Boston, that had this edge, that edge is no longer there because mm -hmm. other teams are employing analytics very heavily. And for a team in a low revenue situation, it makes it that much more challenging. Yeah, so I think what, you know, what's most dramatically changed is that, and I really credit Theo with this, you know, is that the, most of the, some or most of the, of the large market clubs have understood, you know, so when I first got in, that opportunity existed that the only uh, place that they exploited their resources was major league free agency. And I was fine with that, you know, I mean, because everyone out there, you guys know major league free agency is an inefficient market, you know, so if they want to deploy their resources in major league free agency, then we could find other areas to bridge gaps. We could find other areas to bridge payroll discrepancy and, and resource to, uh, and, and revenue, you know, differences. Um, but what happened is Theo kind of said, well, what if we exploit our resources not just in major league free agency, what if we did it in the draft, in international market, you know, in front office, in player development staff, in technology, and in every single area. And other teams, especially the Yankees, follow. Not every team has. There's still that opportunity out there. You know, the Cubs will now, um, as you heard yesterday. And so we've had to continue to look for new ways. And the opportunities have gotten smaller and smaller. And the windows are more and more of a reality. The cycles of winning that you and I talk about privately as well. Um, and so that, that's really changed. There still are huge ranges of how people use that. Now, I think everybody, it's like when sports psychology became big. Everybody has a sports psychologist. You know, everybody has one. I think it's almost to placate and to check the box and say, you know, we have analytics department. You know, we, we utilize data, you know. Everybody has it to placate an owner or different teams utilize it to different levels still. <clears throat> you know, three years ago, Keith Wollner has won, you know, full time, two, you know, four full time people, and which is for us is a, you know, huge explosion, you know, yeah. and, that, and that reality is it makes a difference to have 20. I mean, that's not, that's not small. I mean, you guys can think about the amount of uh, work that they're able to do and the amount of, you know, proprietary information they're able to and, and, and analysis they're able to come up with and how that can impact decisions and you've got a GM who openly accepts that, you know, which makes a big difference too. Um, but the reality is that it's another area where resources can be exploited, you know, and hiring more people, um, having more capability to uh, handle data and manage data, um, you know, there's resources make a difference on that frontier as well, and they didn't used to. It didn't used to be an area where resources mattered. It was an area where we could out hustle. You know, we can't out hustle now. We have to, we have to allocate a portion of our, you know, of our dollars to spend there. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the time. Thanks. <laughs>